Sky Brook. November the 2nd, 1917, Regent Square, Bloomsbury, London. A street scavenger known to his friends as Jack the Sweeper, no relation to Jack the Ripper, is going about his usual business of sweeping up the leaves and debris of a London square when he comes across a parcel wrapped in sacking just inside the railings of the garden. Hello, what's this? Somebody left some old clothes here or something, eh? Let's have a look. What the... what... what is all... Just... <laughs> yes, of course, you are right. Not just a body. Part of a body. Headless, legless, and handless. The body, or it remains, was covered with delicate underclothing of lace and blue ribbon and was wrapped in a sheet. There was also a torn piece of brown paper on which had been scrawled B-L-O-D-I-E-B-E-L-D-I-U-M Bloody Belgium. Have you found anything else, Sergeant? Yes, sir. A search was made in the vicinity immediately after the discovery. A little distance away, in another part of the garden, we found the legs of the victim wrapped in paper. Dr. Spoolsbury is taking a look at those now. Good. If there's one man in London who may help us, it's Dr. Bernard Spilsbury. Even in those days, the name of young Dr. Bernard Spilsbury had earned the respect and admiration of Scotland Yard. Spilsbury, a hard-working pathologist, had devoted his career and life towards the study of the medical aspect of crime. The problem put to him in this case was one of the most difficult in his professional career. I'm afraid there's no hope of positive identification of the victim until the missing head can be found. It is, of course, a woman, but I think if you can give me a little more time, I may be able to help you with some more information. I'm going back to my laboratory now, and I'll be in touch with you later in the day. Very good, Dr. Silfrey. Meantime, I'll do everything I can on my side. Of course, there wasn't much to work on except for that bit of paper. Bloody Belgium. I see it spelled B L O D I E. I wonder what that means. Although World War I was at its height, London was horrified by the atrocious murder of this unknown woman. The scrawled message on the piece of paper naturally gave rise to the suggestion that the victim was a Belgian refugee. Meantime, the investigation, in the hands of Chief Inspector Frederick Wensley, one of the toughest, shrewdest, and most relentless detectives who ever served Scotland Yard, went forward. Now, give a knock, Sergeant. More sound. All right, Sergeant, we'll break the door down. Very good, sir. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll go first. Now, this is the place, all right. There's been a fight in here, sir. Apparently. All those dead birds in the corner. Check them over, Sergeant, and see if they match with the sheet we have. Look, lock it, sir. And the second of them is counted in. Covered with blood. Yes, I see. And over here, sir. There's a bucket. It's full of water. Looks as though there's blood in it, too. Yes. The murder may have been committed here. All the same, there are one or two things I don't quite understand. We'll get Dr. Bernard Silbury along and see what he thinks of it. <laughs> transpired that Madame Gerard had not been seen since 11.15 on the night of October the 31st. In view of Dr. Spilsby's evidence, it looked as though the inspector was right and that she had been murdered about the time the air raid was in progress. According to witnesses, Madame Gerard had left her flat late that night to take refuge. Back to the flat in Munster Square went Inspector Wensley and his assistants to search it yet again for possible clues. Here's something, sir. I found it among the papers on this desk. Now, give it to me. 
I O U fifty pounds L B O I S I N. Yes, what are? And it's payable on the first of November. What are? I don't think we've heard that name before in this case. No, sir. That name's been among the witnesses. Or ask the landlord to see if he knows anybody called Vazin. Uh, Vazin. The landlord proved to be a very loquacious man. He most certainly knew Vazin. He knew all about it. He knew all about all the residents in the flats in Munster Square. The difficulty was to keep him on the subject in hand. Vazin, it seemed, used to be a friend of Madame Gerard's husband, who was a French chef. And Voisin, being a butcher, they had much in common. Gerard used to buy supplies from Voisin at his place in Spitfield Market. Then Gerard went abroad to fight for France. Afterwards, then the landlord, Mrs. Gerard acted as a sort of housekeeper for Voisin. But now she had been at the present flat for some time. Voisin still lived at Charlotte Street, Fitzroy Square. It's funny you should ask about Mr. Voisin. I hadn't seen him for some time, but he came round here to the house the other afternoon. Uh, which afternoon? Well, it had been the afternoon after uh, Madame Gerard disappeared. And the afternoon before we discovered the body. That's right, November the 1st it was. He came round in the afternoon just after lunch. Well, I remember what he said to me. Oh, good evening, Mr. Poison. You're quite a stranger. I haven't seen you for some time. Uh, it's about Madame Gerard, I have called. Oh, I don't think she's in. Come to think of it, I haven't seen her since yesterday. Hmm. Well, the mystery. Uh, she'll be away for several weeks. Oh, nothing of that, right? No, 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 no. It's nothing important. It's just to tell you that she'll be away. Oh, I see. So, by the way, I have to tell you that uh, Madame Girard is expecting a sack of potatoes. And she says, would you be good enough to take them in while they're delivered, you know? Yes, of course I will. And uh, tell Madame Girard I hope we'll see her back very soon. Yes, yes, I I'll tell her that. And that's the last time I've seen Mr. Boisin. What else do you know about this man? Well, I know he's got the key to uh, Madame Gerard's flat because uh, I saw him letting himself in there. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, and what's more, I reckon it was his money which used to pay her rent. Have you got any proof of that? Only she used to pay me every Friday after he'd been to see her. And if he was late or didn't come, then I noticed she didn't pay me until he'd been. And she used to be his housekeeper? Yes, sir. But uh, I think they was pretty good friends. <laughs> detectives reconnoitred Voisin's address in Charlotte Street and found that he lived in a basement flat near some stables. Voisin has until recently been a sorter employed by a wholesale butcher at Smithfield Market but was now in charge of his employer's horses. Having sized up the situation, the man from the yard planned a raid. That afternoon, Voisin, together with a woman friend, Bertha Roche, were seated in the living room of their flat when suddenly... Well, what in the name of the devil? Oh, I don't see what I'm with the police. Oh, you know. I what, what, what do you want? What the yard wanted was evidence, and Wazan's flat told a terrible story. The doors and walls were spattered with blood. Examination of Voisin's flat left no doubt that it had been the scene of an awful crime. This time, Dr. Spilsbury could confirm the authenticity of the evidence. All right, Monsieur Voisin. I think you'll have to come along with me to Bow Street. Must she come too? Yes, I shall want the lady as well. May I pack some of my things? I'm afraid at the moment I can't allow you to touch anything or take it away with you. Very well. Come along now. While Voisin and Bertha Roche were taken to Bow Street, detectives questioned their neighbors for further evidence. It appeared that on the night of October the 31st, the voices of two women in violent altercation had been heard coming from Voisin's room. 
This had not commanded much attention at the time on account of the air raid. At about 8 o'clock the following morning, Bertha Roche had been seen by one of her neighbors drawing water from a tap. The neighbor spoke to her, and she replied that Voisin had been killing a calf, and that she was fetching water to wash his shirt. Voisin was searched, and the key to the door of a cellar in Sarah Street was found in his pocket. Detectives were dispatched to search the cellar, and there, buried in a tub of sawdust, they found the missing heads and hands of the murdered woman. Bertha Roche were detained at Bow Street for the night, while Wensley carefully considered the evidence against them. It was a matter of common sense that one or the other, or both of them, had murdered Madame Gerard. In view of the medical report, however, the extent to which Voisin might be implicated was uncertain. A test occurred to Wednesday which would go a long way towards determining the guilt or innocence of Voisin, and he decided to apply it. Now, Mr. Voisin, I wonder if you'd be prepared to help me. Uh, what do you want me to do? Have you any objection to writing the word bloody Belgium on this piece of paper? No, not at all. There you are. Thank you. Uh, would you mind writing it again? Um, it'll do on the same piece of paper. All right. Thank you. And once again. Thank you very much indeed. Oh... By the way, I see you spell bloody, B-L-O-D-I-E. Yes. And you spelt it that way three times. Yes. Mr. Poisson, do you always spell it that way? I don't know. Louis Poisson and Bertha Roche, I'm going to charge you with the murder of Emilien Gerard. I must warn you that anything you may say may be taken down as evidence and used at your trial. <laughs> later, Voisin volunteered a statement. It was an attempt to adapt his own story to the discoveries he knew the police had made, and at the same time to exonerate Bertha Roche. Dr. Spilsbury had, in fact, reconstructed the true story of the crime. The head of the woman was covered with wounds which must have been inflicted with some weapon such as a poker. There were literally dozens of the wounds. There were cuts and bruises on the woman's hand, which had been caused as she had tried to ward off the blows that had rained upon her head. Whoever had struck the blows was someone of no great physical strength. The woman died not from the direct effect of the blows, but from loss of blood. She survived the attack for probably half an hour. An examination of the heart indicates partial strangulation. We are therefore able to build up the following picture of the crime. The woman was attacked with a poker or similar weapon by someone of no great strength. She fought for her life and no doubt screamed for help. While blows were still being rained on her, a second person must have thrown something over her head, no doubt with the object of stifling her cries. Next we turn to the question of dismemberment. The body was dismembered by someone of unusual strength who was accustomed to the use of a knife. The cuts indicate experience of dissection but no surgical knowledge. We can therefore conclude that two people were concerned in the crime. And so Dr. Spilsbury, working independently in his laboratory, had reached the same conclusions as Inspector Wensley. Madame Gerard, so far as could be discovered, had never met Bertha Roche, and did not even know of her existence. On the night of the air raid, Madame Gerard had left her flat in Regent's Park and taken shelter in a tube station. The rest can only be surmised. But we can imagine that when the all-clear signal was given, the crowd of white refugees was turned out so that the tube station could be closed for the night. <laughs> Madame 
Madame Gerard must have made her way to Voisin's room, intending to spend the rest of the night in the security of his cellar. Here she must have found Bertha Roche. The scene between the two women can be imagined. Both had been in a hysterical terror throughout the air raid. Madame Gerard intends that the discovery of her rival may have abused Bertha Roche. She, maddened by the other's taunts, must have picked up the weapon nearest to her hand and attacked the intruder. Voisin, sleeping in the next room, must have been awakened by the noise, rushed into the room, thrown a towel around the head of the screaming woman. The blows and suffocation must have continued for some time until finally Amelia and Gerard lay dead. Imagine Voisin and Bertha Roche sitting up all night, talking of ways and means of disposing of the body. And then, next day, Voisin visiting Madame Gerard's flat to lay a false trail of evidence, all to no avail. And finally, Voisin going out on his awful task of disposing of the body. The trial came on at the Old Bailey for Mr. Justice Darling. Spilsby and Wensley were convinced in their own minds that Bertha Roche must have attacked Madame Gerard that there could be no legal proof of this. A submission was made on her behalf that there was no case to go to the jury, and the judge gave his ruling. There is a good deal of evidence against Roche to show that she was an accessory after the fact of the murder, but there is not evidence to prove that she necessarily took part in the crime itself. I shall therefore direct the jury to return a verdict of not guilty in regard to her. <laughs> Bertha Roche was there upon discharge, and the trial continued with Voisin alone in the dock. The evidence of Dr. Spilsbury decided the case for the prosecution. The jury took only a quarter of an hour to decide that Voisin was guilty. Mr. Justice Darling passed sentence of death in French. <laughs> On the day before Voisin was executed, Bertha Roche appeared at the Old Bailey and was sentenced to seven years' penal servitude as an accessory after the murder. She died in prison a year later. Oh, and by the way, nobody ever discovered why Voisin wrote those crude words on the piece of paper he left with the body. Those words which were to help to hang him for a murder most foul.